Welcome to Oxford. Welcome to the Maison Française d'Oxford. Bienvenue à la Maison Française d'Oxford. Um, sorry about the slight delay ironing out technical hitches and many thanks to Anne-Sophie and to Rob, our technical team. Bienvenue donc à cette rencontre qui nous réjouit à, à plus d'un titre puisque c'est une rencontre entre une romancière que nous aimons beaucoup à Oxford, Maïlis de Kerangal, et sa traductrice Jessica Moore. So we're very much looking forward to what's going to be um, a Franco-English in linguistic terms, but also um, a triangular UK, France and Canada um, meeting with Maïlis de Kerangal and her translator Jessica Moore. So if Maïlis and Jessica, you could join us. Um, we will then have our conversation. So just to remind members of the audience, we'd be very happy to take your questions if you have any. If you pop them in the chat, they should be sent across to us. So, bienvenue Maïlis, so welcome Jessica. Wonderful to have you. And I'm so sorry it can't be in person. Um, Maïlis um, came over when Men the Living um, was yes. translated also by, by Jessica and we Thank had you. a wonderful time. So we hope to have you back in Oxford soon, but in the meantime, we're delighted to have you on screen. So we have you both with us today um, because um, Jessica is the translator, not only of Maïlis's book, which has just come out, Painting Time, but also of um, several other books by Maïlis, uh, some which have already come out. And in particular, I mentioned um, Mend the Living, for which Maïlis um, got the Welcome Prize. And we all know how important translators are in international prizes like that. Mend the Living was also shortlisted for the International Man Booker Prize. Uh, so we're particularly glad to have a, a double act in the sense between the author and her translator. Now, Maïlis's English, I know, is fantastic. Um, so she'll be speaking English, but she'll, if she wants to speak French some of the time, then I will translate Thank as best you. I can. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll kick off with the obvious question, Maïlis. Um, so your new novel uh, is called Painting Time in English. Can you tell us in a few words what it's about? Oh, it's about the story of... Um young person, Paula Karst, uh, a, for an average young girl who became um, a painter in decoration. And something between an artist and a uh, craft... Um, craft craft woman. Craftswoman. And uh, it is, I wanted to, to write a book about what is to learn, what is to learn something what is to become an adult, what is to enter in an adult life, and what is to discovering the world by perhaps painting it, and uh, uh, what is to take her, uh, her own place into that kind of world, what is illusion and, uh, and truth. And I wanted also as a writer, ask myself, what is a deep matter of fiction? What is my relationship to, to fiction? And, um, and also, and finally, what is to invent something? What, what is to be the author of something? Because Paula is learning to recreate matters, surfaces like wood, marbles, kinds of sceneries, decoration. And um, she, she is not, uh, she has to remake uh, things and reproduce, you know? And so uh, I, for me, it was very powerful to, to follow her path because she, she, is, uh, she was for me both an, an artist, an author, but also something which, uh, who can give us access to uh, the, real, the reality, I think. Thank you very much, Maëlys. That's an absolutely fantastic summary. Um, the book, as Maëlys has suggested, you know, reads like a story, almost a, a coming of age novel, but has this extraordinary depth to it in its reflection 
on what is reality, what is um, fiction, what is created, what is invented. Um, so I think it has so many uh, different levels to it. it. It's an absolutely fascinating read. And thinking about that, I'd like to um, bring you both in um, because the title in French and the title in English are different. And I think they're both really interesting titles and they both tell us something quite rich about the book. So could we start off, Maëlise, with the French title? Could you say a few words about the French title, please? The French, ti the French title is A World at Rich on the Hand. Is, it is that, Jessica, in uh, French? A Monde à portée de main. À portée de main, just. And uh, for me, it, it was, um, for us, it contains the word hand. And I, want, I was not obsessed by heart and heart of painting in my book. I wanted to uh, be um, to give a story about what is to paint as an action. And we are in that book uh, looking at the physically manners, uh, painting as an act, in fact. What is to paint, not what is painting and hearts and genius, etc. What is materials, brushes, gesture, uh, the life, and uh, and the, uh, in in that book, Paula is learning to recreate the surfaces of the world. So the world, the world, is, she she enters and she's initiated to the world by painting it. So the world is just just there, vibrating under her hand. Yes, because the um, I think in English, and Jessica will correct me um, if I'm wrong. Um, in English, we'd say within reach. That would be the expression we would use for a portée de main, within reach. So something you can actually reach out and touch. But the French expression with having handed it has this almost punning value. It means it's something, yes, which, you, which is within, within reach, but also something that you can touch um, with, yes. with the hand. And something I is think- there, some, Something is there. You are separate from it, but if you mobilize all your body, your mind, your courage you can touch it and it's about physical sensation and i and i think there's something of the the possible of, of the possible pun but a different pun in the english title so can you say a little bit about your choice of english title jessica please i can speak to the title um but painting time was wasn't my choice it was it had a lot to do with my lease actually and mm -hmm. and with the with the publishers for me the book still is called a world within reach and i i played for a long time with yeah so there's that physical importance of the hand and i played for a long time with things like at your fingertips, which is another expression that might touch it, but it's a bit too clunky for something like a title. Um, and then there are the two, two times in the novel where the echo comes up of it being something being just within reach, just à portée de main. And I love, as a reader and as a translator, I love when you're reading and you come upon that echo that suddenly brings the title to life in a way. So it's not it's not lost because we still have all the echoes of why it's a, why it's a physical thing and why there's the, the closeness and the proximity and yet the distance of the thing. And so, yeah, I had to, I had to be convinced about yeah. painting time, but I, I do yeah. think it stands well for the in, book. In fact, our publisher, as publisher of the book, was thinking that it was, um, he, he proposed uh, painting time. And I thought it was also a good title. Uh, he, he, he didn't. He didn't like too much uh, the French title. He, he, he thought it was perhaps too abstract. And but painting time also is a little bit mystery, uh, mysterious. But painting time for me, it's, it works. I, I I hope Jessica, you will like it. I do like it <laughs> because it's in in that book. It is also about prehistoric times and. A link between that young lady Paula, that young girl, uh, uh, which is going to, during all the book, to paint onto the walls, and the painter of Paleolithic times that have painted the caves of Lascaux. 
Because I think if you read the title in English, you can read painting time or painting time, and they don't mean exactly the same thing. So painting time would be, you know, il est l'heure de peindre, <laughs> which is something which, which um, Paula I mean, does, <laughs> and she's doing it actively, then painting time, peindre le temps. So I think it's a very clever title in that respect, because when you see it, you don't exactly know how to read it before you've read the book. So, so I think it's, it That's does. That's great, yeah. yeah I, I didn't think it's knew a, that. I didn't knew that. I think it's clever and, and ambiguous. But so, Jessica, when I asked you the question, you said it had a lot to do with my lease. Can you tell me a bit more, the two of you, about working, you, Jessica, as a translator, working with an author and my lease as an author, the way your books are translated into many, many languages, how relationships develop with translators, whether there are translators you, you know and work with, others you don't know, and so on. So could, could we start Jessica off perhaps first? With what our working relationship is like? Yeah. Um, so I, I tend to save my questions for my lease until the end. Um, and I also tend to try to have combed through them very, very thoroughly with several francophones before I bring them to her. Um, so I, I uh, with this one, I, had a few questions at the end and and my least might remember differently but there was this actually this beautiful um opportunity that i had to miss of being with the group of translators into yes, many different in languages how, of this yeah. book we had so, a workshop in 20 uh to in in 19 in 2019 2019 with uh in a but jessica was uh, was not here, mm, wasn't there. My twins were one and a half at the time and I had already dragged them to France so I couldn't go back again. But this that seemed like an incredible chance as a workshop where um, I think six different translators into different yeah. languages yeah. got to meet with my lease and look at the books that she consulted on artistic terms and yeah, speak to her about her research directly. Um, so I do tend to use, um, well, as I said, I, I'll always consult with Francophone friends. And in this, for this book, I had a friend who really accompanied my work in a very generous and enthusiastic way. And she's, she happens to be a visual artist as well who lives in France. Her name is Amélie. And yeah, she, she was, her enthusiasm helped me along tremendously. And then at the end, I do come to my lease with a few that are still remaining. Mm. I, I could add, add something. Um, I would like to say that, in fact, uh, the relationship between an author and a translator is something very, very enigmatic because for me, I, I don't uh, know Jessica uh, as an, a person. I mean, we live in two separate countries, very far, uh, each one from the other. We met several times, but for short times. And, uh, but, but we met and it was important. We met uh, in Toronto and we met also in France. And uh, we are so, so separate. And in fact, perhaps it is one of the person, she knows me the most intimate intimately, I, I don't know. Intimately, perfect. Intimately, because um, uh, she, she knows me by, by the writing, she knows me by the language. And uh, I, I think that, because she, she, she translated uh, Birth of a Bridge and then Man the Living, which was a great adventure for, for me and her. And uh, now this book, which was uh, quite uh, hard, perhaps a little bit hard, and and she will translate uh, canoes and perhaps uh, also tangent vers l'est. And we are now together. And I wanted to say that for me, it was a grace to uh, meet Jessica because she is not only it is connecting in my in my head to that question of what is to be an author because the author of the english text is jessica in fact you know in fact she an author is not only someone who translates text but she's writing the text you know so 
it's it's for me the 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 fact she is also a poetess and and uh, she had the meaning the 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 sense of voice. Uh, it uh, she, she's very close from me, and I think it's a, I am a very lucky person to to have a, such a translator. I don't see that to say uh, any compliments, but I really it's very. Uh, important and I, I am very happy to have the occasion to op the opportunity to to tell that. Thank and you. Think, it's wonderful to hear. And I, and I think we can we can confirm that um, certainly Maylis's English language readers have um, all appreciated the the beauty of the texts which are mediated thanks to um, Jessica's uh, <laughs> translation. So so I, I think we have sort of objective confirmation. Of, of the fact. And so how did you um, end up being Maylis's translator, Jessica? Can you, can you tell us a bit about that? Well, it started on a dance floor. <laughs> like <laughs> the most beautiful stories. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With someone wearing a beautiful peacock blue blazer and I just had to go compliment him on his blazer. And, <laughs> and he turned out to be the books um, and literature officer for the consul French consulate in Toronto at the time. And I was a, a very new, a very, very new translator. And I asked him for recommendations for things that had not yet been translated. And he rhapsodized about my Lisa's writing. He, this is David Cresso. He is one of um, my Lisa's most ardent fans and um, Birth of a Bridge had come out recently, or Naissance d'un Pont had come out recently, and um, and so I pitched it, and it all it all happened. It's a great stroke of luck. It's a great story too. Um, <laughs> but so so it means that you actually were looking at, actively for for books to translate, and you then had this book and possibly others suggested to you, but it was your interest in the book. So from the start you identified this as a book you wanted to translate. Mm -hmm. that point. Yeah, and as translator, I think also as new translators, especially we have to take on so many roles, one of them being as the agent for the book. Like mm -hmm. I had to be the one to pitch it and talk it up to the, to the publishers here in Canada. And yeah, that's how yeah. it- You were yeah. the first. You were right. the first. And I have also a special story to say because um, you know that Man the Living has two translations in English due to editorial uh, rights I mean, issues, yeah. Relations. And, um, and for me, uh, what I said uh, before, it uh, became very incarnated in my own story of author translated in English because when I, when I read, I can't. I can read this translation. I cannot judge them often, but I can mm -hmm. follow the the language and and the rhythm. And I and uh, and uh, I was in front of two different texts, and mm -hmm. um, I'm so happy uh, Jessica accepted to to translate painting times because uh, you know as as a musician and as a poet and has uh, her her voice. I mean. <laughs> Uh, could fit perfectly to to my work in fact so it, it resonates to use a, a mm. term which has has musical um mm. value value too um i think that's a really no that's a really interesting comment i think and you mentioned um something which i'd like us to talk about um jessica you mentioned it on the way past talking about this sort of great convention of translators you mentioned the books my lease um, read. So can you tell us a bit, Maylis, it's one of the things which strikes me. And I remember when I interviewed you after Men the Living, a lady came up to you who was a doctor and who said, I have read so many stories which talk about operating theatres and there's always something which sounds wrong, but yours <laughs> absolutely sounded right. She said, for me, as a doctor who operates um, you know, on people all the time, this this was told the right way um, and you are somebody who does a lot of homework you don't just sit and tell a story there's actually an awful lot of background work and can you tell us a bit about your research for this particular yes. book please 
Yes, it's it's a uh, it's a very very interesting for me because uh, when I, I the research not become in first. I mean, I'm starting to to think about the book and I'm starting to write and then I mean I follow uh, the documentation follows the fiction and I think the more I am uh, the more I document my book, the more fiction. Uh, is free, you know, uh, uh, and find her own freedom. And um, there is two things for me important in documentation. In that book, uh, I read about um, about tools and materials. I mean, also brushes or material, and also uh, I something important. I I managed to go to the places of the book. I mean, I went to Brussels in uh, that uh, school, oh, it's called the Peinture de la Rue du Métal, to see in that incredible um, atelier, incredible uh, workplace, studio, uh, to, to see the students learning and uh, with the uh, the roof in glass and uh, and the and also that 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 very matte light and uh, to see also the traditional way they are uh, of painting they are teached uh, student are teached and uh, after that I went to Chinechita also to see what is uh, backlots what what are backlots what what uh, backlots look like and what is a big big scenery what is a set what is painting a set and when I was I was in Moscow and I managed to see also the, this studio and I and I when I uh, that day when I when I came to the, the studio in Moscow, I I, I uh, discovered they were shooting Anna Karenin, and I was in Orlov um, Orlov uh, ballroom, and it it was incredible for me. I, I I thought that was I was in the book, and and of course I went to a lot to see uh, the the huge studio where uh, painters were recreating Lascaux caves in Dordogne. And I, I, I was very, very interested by how, how they are together and, and how they work. In fact, writing gives me, um, it is an adventure in that time. It gave me, a, I mean, a physical and a personal adventure. My life is changing and I, I like uh, going there and there. But there is also um, uh, uh, something which is more important in terms uh, of uh, writing and in terms of literature that it is that this, uh, this documentation gives me uh, the sentiment to be loyal to my, to my subject. And um, it's very important because I, I am a describer. I, li I like to describe and I think that I have not to judge, but I have to show and to describe. And so the richness of the writing is, is very, very important. And during my research, I'm very interested by all that kind of uh, vocabulary, the low pieces of our language that have no literal dignity. And I try to, to um, hold them and to put them in my, the novel sentences, you know, to, to reactive, reactivate, to- Reactivate. To, to reactivate them. And, and uh, so, so all the, I have, uh, I love, uh, I like the technical vocabularies and, and, and I think also precisions and details that uh, are so important because it gives us uh, um, the prise uh, way of old, holding like on a wall when you have li a little place to, to a, a little place to hold, to hold the way to yeah. attraper des prises un peu sur un mur. And uh, details gave me that sensation and it's very important to me because I don't, I don't think that novel is the, the place where you can write in general and, uh, but it's the, it is the contrary. Novel is the perfect place to be very cautious and to put a granular, granular attention to things, 
to restore their uh, specificity, their singularity. And it's a way for me to resist to the global language we, we are, uh, in, in which we are emerged. You, you understand? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. No, that's okay. so, fascinating. Uh, so so I, I'm working a lot to create a, lang a language which is also a way of resisting to um, uh, language of uh, uh, broadcast news and you know uh, everything uh, very very fast and and it's it's uh, it's uh, for me it's a way of being cautious and I I'm trying to build a writing of cautious uh, of we say attention une écriture de l'attention to we we have to be attentive in terms of listening in terms of feeling in terms of looking at something and uh, I I am amazed that I discover my own language by writing you see I for me writing is also an initiation to my own language because I discover lexicals vocabularies and so on so it's it's for me it's it's a huge like um, a motor. It's a huge energy that gave it uh, that, that gives to me docu documentation. Thank you, and um, certainly for the reader, you do get the the focused attention on language, um, the extraordinary detail, and there is, I think, um, and I, I'd like to bring Jessica in on this. Um, there's a texture to Maylise's writing, a depth, but really a texture too. Um, and I think that's probably what is being achieved by this um, way of writing against sort of mm -hmm. global speak. Right. Um, I think global. texture is the word the word I, I would want to use. W would that be fair? I think that's a beautiful way of describing it. And also I'm just, you know, again, so struck by hearing Miley speak about her own work and this idea of handholds, like, these low, lo, quote unquote, lower words being lifted up to become handholds. It's just beautiful. It's making me think of um, when I when I did meet my least for, I guess for the second time, and we spoke about the names in Men the Living, and the names are all so yeah. crucial. Yeah. I remember my least you saying that the, the names are like, little stones in the sentence and they remain unchanged but they shine somehow on everything that's mm -hmm. around them and give mm -hmm. give a nuance to what's around so yeah i think uh, textured is a good good way to describe this combination of very technical and then very antiquated or elevated language and yeah it's it's that's one of the the grand challenges of translating and really one of the things that makes her writing so distinct I, i'm sure it must be um a challenge um and indeed speaking of names paula gast of course has a a surname which is an incredibly um important beacon in a sense um within yeah, within yes. the, the the novel um I, i'd like us to listen to a little bit of the novel um, and um, Maylis, you've chosen a passage um, to read, which, which Jessica is happy to read um, in, in English uh, for us. Do you want to read it in French as well, or are we just going to go for the English? I think it's okay in English, yes. Great, then if you don't mind, Jessica, yeah. you could listen to that. And just um, while you get your copy of the book, to remind people listening to us live, that they can put questions in the chat and we will do our best to um, pose them to Maylis and Jessica. And you may ask your questions, obviously, in English or en français au choix. Thank you. Okay, so here's Paula at the Institute in Brussels. Dazzled from the moment she steps through the studio doorway on the first day, entering a rectangular room of 15 by 10 meters, cement floor and glass roof, with a mezzanine running along all four walls used for storing hundreds of rollers and drawing pads, samples and small tools. Paula immediately likes the light of beginnings that bathes the place, 
a white mat light made that much clearer by the dimness of the lobby and the hallway, as though it were necessary to pass through an airlock of opacity in order to be able to see clearly and then get to work. 20 odd easels are positioned throughout the room. She threads her way towards one at the back, sets her paint box down on a wooden stool and puts on her smock. The other students spread out through the room. She hears English being spoken a few meters ahead, stands at the ready, and then the woman in the black turtleneck makes her entrance, small here, smaller than in Paula's memory of her, but immediately occupying a significant volume of space. Then the inventory. The director calls out the name of each paintbrush and the students verify that it's in their box and Paula's are lovely and clean, the ferrules sparkling, the bristles soft. Here an ink brush, an angled brush with hog bristles, a veinette, a script brush, a slender brush with a wooden handle and a Kalinsky table, and the one she would consider her lucky brush, a lacquer brush with Alaskan bear bristles, a gift from Marie, her mother, given to her the day before she left. There are many whose function Paula doesn't really know. She placed them in the box the way you might assemble a gang before a break-in, assuring yourself of their silent and loyal, pre silent and loyal presence and which she examines now with curiosity. These are the tools for remaking the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. The tools for remaking the world, um, mm -hmm. which are the novelist's tools, because what does the novelist do um, other than remake the world, but which are here Paula's tools. Um, and I think you, outlined this sort of function of the novel when you, you presented the subject to us, my niece. And I'm interested in what you said earlier on about going to the different places, about going to Chinichita, about going to Russia, etc. To what extent, when you start out, do you know where the novel is going? Or to what extent are you changed by the novel as you write it? No, I, uh, you know, for example, this novel is, was quite singular for me because at first I wanted only to uh, write about the, um, the two, you, two majors working place that have been created in Ardèche, in La Grotte Chauvet, and also in Montignac for Lasco in uh, 2015 and 2016, that uh, these two, this two huge project of re of cloner uh, cloner these two prehistoric cave, and I I am very passionate by ancient times and arche archaeologic times and pre prehistoric times, and I uh, first I was very uh, interested by uh, what is what is that story of uh, re recreating a. Uh, uh, cloning, uh, uh, clonering, excuse me, clonering a okay. cave. Why? Why building false, a false form? Uh, uh, do you, it is um, really interesting to uh, promote that kind of artifact uh, instead of uh, introducing the real artifact by perhaps uh, other, other um, kind of uh, expressions. And uh, when, I, when I started, I, I went first in Montignac. And uh, when I met the first uh, painters, when, when uh, the first painters I, I've, I've met were very interesting. And they were, uh, they were painting uh, with all their materials and also with all the system by a photograph and uh, uh, and um, I started to ask myself how you become uh, that kind of faussaire, you know, because uh, on, on the workplace they are calling faussaire. I don't know what is the, the term in, in English, you know, when you... Faussaire? Forger. For, forger, okay. And, um, and I, I began to to be interested by how do you become that kind of person? And the book shift towards Brussels and the parts on Brussels take 
I thought I was, it was only to start an introduction and it became quite half of the book because uh, the book began um, uh, an, initia an initiation Roman, a Roman of formation, a Roman of... Uh, we, we say Bildungsroman. Bildungsroman, <laughs> yes. A Bildungsroman. And, uh, and, it, and it's, it's, it is to say that um, the, the, the book is not following a uh, synopsis or pronoun. I mean, what I, dis what I discover during the writing can, uh, can shift the path of the book. And uh, I have the, I, I want it that I have sometimes the, the starting point and also the reaching one. The, I, but I have these two points, but the trajectory is very free. But in fact, uh, for that book, I wanted to uh, finish inside, uh, inside uh, Lasco because I wanted to, I was asking me if you can, if time can collapse when you are painting and if a young 20, 25 years old girl can uh, feel as uh, she was a paleolithic painter when she's reproducing exactly with mat the same materials and the same techniques and perhaps the same gesture what happened uh, to uh, 20,000 years ago in that case. Yes, so it's a return to the origins of yeah. art, yeah. Um, but also to the, the origins of the artistic gesture. Um, yes. Yes. De main, and the same, yeah. the same gestures which, which they're making. And you're also somebody very interested in art, Maylis. I know you've um, done work curating yeah. with the Musée d'Orsay, Yes. And working with students. Can you tell us a little bit about that yes. particular project? Yes, I was invited to spend the, ninth, the 2020 year uh, in, as an artist invited in Orsay. And I imagine um, an exhibition. It was, it was a work uh, leading, um, which occurs with um, young uh, collegian, I mean, uh, students school, school children school children but around around 18 years old okay. and uh, I imagine a um, uh, project where um, we have to find and to think about what is to represent the reading what is a painting of a reading you know what is a, uh, how the painters manage to uh, give a presence of book first uh, where are the books in the paintings, but also uh, how, what is to paint the experience and the interior is experience of reading, like for example, in the Fontaine Latour magnificent uh, paintings called La Liseuse, and uh, with a, a girl which is completely um, emerged in her book. And I was very interested by uh, this connection between painting and reading, which was um, naturally following the writing of painting time. And it was great to work because we, we have to choose to pick it up into the collection of Orsay, painting that could illustrate uh, how, how you can give an image of what is to read a book uh, in terms of experience. And I'd like to come back to you, Jessica, as the person who had the experience, in a sense, both of reading the book and as my Lisa said, of being the author of the book since you wrote the translation. So can you tell us a bit about how you, in a sense, navigate between um, the first experience um, as, the, as the reader and then the, the work bringing through uh, what Mylis was saying um, and, and changing language. Mm. That's a nicely phrased, nicely phrased question of how of the experience of translating. I one of the things I was thinking about in coming here today was was what it is that I really love in in translating. And one of the parts that 
stood out for me is that it feels as I'm translating it often feels like I'm being told a story like a story is being spoken directly to me into my ear and I'm sort of I, I when I do my first draft I go very fast I just do a really slapdash very bad first draft and then go back and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite so that sort of the speed of it helps me and I've been told by um, translation colleagues in residency that it starts to sound like the like the sound of it like a train going really fast when I'm typing in, on the first draft and but yeah this this sensation of a story that's just of being the receiver of a story is is really one of the things that I enjoy so much um, I've often also thought about what it's like to inhabit this space entre deux and that's gaining some new um, resonance for me now being the mother of twins <laughs> to be between <laughs> two. <laughs> but I, I spend a lot of time in sort of this, this, the shadowy corridors between the two languages. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of, it, there's a lot of looking up that I do as I'm going. There's a lot of dictionary consulting. And so there's all the, all the work of deciphering. And then I think the real satisfaction comes in then seeing the words land and feeling as a writer that they, that they sound as they should in English. I, I, I don't, I think I was a bit roundabout in that answer, but does that answer your question? A, a great answer, and I love the image of the shadowy corridors between the languages, which I think um, a lot of us who live between languages um, mm -hmm. inhabit um, often. And shadowy car corridors, which sometimes actually allow us to go through doors which weren't there, mm -hmm. because suddenly you realize that you can force the language, that you can actually give it something new. Um, mm. which, which, which wasn't there. You could you could bring something from the other language um, and, and in a sense feed mm. it to the mm. language um, in, in, in which you're writing. And I imagine that Maylis is the sort of writer who allows one to do that because um, that there's such a tactile um, aspect to much of her, her language that you know it presumably yeah. allows you to, to experiment sometimes. Yes, such an inventiveness, it's true. And yeah, sometimes that is one of the great challenges is to make the English match that kind of inventiveness because it's so easy. To, and this goes back to my least you speaking about being a, a writer of attention, like the kind of attentiveness that is needed as the translator is to not ever slip into what like the habitual patterns of speech or or thought because that's not how it's written in French. It really is like a constant work of innovation. And so I have to remain ultra alert in, in the translating. And I'm I'm interested, sorry, um, Maylis, did you want to answer that or? No, it's, it's okay. No, no, I, I because Because what I wanted to ask you as a result of um, Jessica, in a sense, allowing us into her workshop um, and saying that her first translations are, are very sort of quick and dirty, as we would say in English, um, and that she will then go back and hone different bits, um, looking for the right word, the right expression, the right rhythm, the right sound. Um, how do you write um, when you're writing the first stage? Is it a similar process? No, in fact, I am, I am, I write, I write only one, once, because I cannot um, go ahead without, uh, if the text before is not perfect for me, you know, I, I, I can, so um, I, I am slow, but I, uh, I go ahead slowly, but I only write, write once. Of course, when I, at the end, I take it again, I read it, and I make cor corrections. And uh, sometimes uh, this, this um, I, I, I add some things, or these corrections are important. But for me, it isn't, I couldn't write if it was not, um, if it was, uh, uh, if I knew it was uh, not, um, the, just a draft, not, yes, not a sort yes, of final yes, version. Yes. It, for me, I am always in the definitive version, even if I, I uh, 
uh, even if I correct the text, yes. So, and so this also means that you have to have done all your research before you actually write it. No, in fact, I don't do it before. I do it during the very during because it's a way for me because I th I always uh, thought that if you are doing the research before, you are um, leading to. Uh, be obsessed by the documentation. Mm -hmm. I have to speak about that. I don't have to forget that. And it is, and it's quite artificial. I try to be connected to a kind of uh, pulsation, very personal and, and my own voices. My and I I cannot do that. I prefer keeping an organic uh, way of writing, which mixed. Uh, at the same time, research and fiction. And I, as I, I told you, uh, the the first when I when I tried when I first worked like that, I discovered that uh, uh, on the um, on the um, at the contrary of the general thinking, uh, the more you are documented the more the 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 space of fiction of uh, the is the fiction is emancipating you know because uh, it's but i need to be i need to be documented to imagine i i think i all my documentation is important i need it to uh, to apply this work to enter in this very special work of what Baudelaire uh, said, le travail de l'imagination, the work of imagination, which is not, which is uh, no more than catch and reveal the mysterious and secret links between things. And, you know, uh, um, put two ideas together. When you think to something, you, you, uh, you think to another thing, then, all this link, it's like a tissue, in fact. And I can do that if I have a documentation which is quite strong, because when I'm doing all this little trip in, for example, for that book in Belgium or in Italy, I harvest language, I harvest vocabularies, I harvest uh, many special works and expressions that that is uh, very, that tonify my on relationship to my book and, and, and language. So, so you're gleaning words as you as you go along. Um, and do you take notes, for instance, when you went yes. um, to the Rue du Métal, are you taking notes? <laughs> yes, I am like Paula, because she has her black black book where when she, and, and uh, at one time she, she felt that words were uh, only linked to reality. But I do the same. I, I note I and everything is written in, in my carnet, I don't know, in my little uh, book. Little black book. Like little black book, like, like yes. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that um, we're, we're going to have to draw this absolutely fascinating conversation to uh, a close. You've both of you been absolutely wonderful. Um, and I'm Thank sure. Thank you very much. Uh, our listeners uh, will have been uh, and spectators will have been um, enchanted to, uh, to to watch this. And I'm going to um, end with a final question for for both of you, um, which is, what what are you up to now? And I don't mean in the next half hour because I know my lease you're then rushing off the front front row. Um, but what are, what are you up to now, Jessica? Uh, well, I'm. I'm working on a book of nonfiction about motherhood and that space between. And I am translating two of my Lisa's books coming up. I'm in the middle of Tangente vers l'Est, um, and I'll be translating the short stories Canoes. Mm. And I hope we can um, have you both back when they come out in English <laughs> for another conversation. Uh, and Maylis, what are your current occupations? Uh, I'm I'm writing another book, but it's uh, with another woman. We are two, and we are trying to write together a new a fiction. So it's a completely different story, but uh, it's a short essay. It's a kind of research also in terms of uh, what is to be two authors, 
and uh, and I have also a novel in in course in in progress on my own. Yeah. Well, we're very <laughs> much looking forward to uh, reading these texts in in, in French. Much and in English, and we're getting enthusiastic feedback from the, the audience. So thank you all um, so much. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful once again. I know that I'm going to take away all sorts of um, ideas and thoughts, and I'm not alone in doing so. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to our audience, um, and I very much hope, à bientôt. À bientôt, merci beaucoup. Au thank revoir. You. Merci.